All right, so hi everyone. Uh, so great to see so many of you here. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me as well. Um, I'm going to talk today about a general problem of proving that two objects are indistinguishable and how to prove that and how to develop tools uh, to do that. And the reason I, I'm going to do that is that, as you will see, uh, this is a general framework of problems that includes many hard questions that are inherently combinatorial and hence the, um, the topic of the school. So today it is going to be uh, more um, so simpler things and tomorrow we'll move to some more uh, advanced problems. Although depending on your background uh, this might be either very simple if you work in this space or might be completely new so uh, it's completely intentional. So feel free to stop me at any time and give me any question. And, and again, since there was no introduction, so my name is uh, Stefano Tessaro. I'm a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I've been working in this space for, for a long while. So what is the uh, general context here? So we want to look at cryptographic security in a concrete, uh, quantitative way. So generally what that means is that we associate a scheme and a particular security model with an advantage function that is going to tell us how well an adversary can break this particular scheme uh, given a certain amount of resources. And this advantage could be, for example, the probability of breaking the scheme, say the probability of finding the key, the probability of forging a signature, depends on the context, right? It could be a bunch of different things. And the same is true for resources, right? So generally, what we think of as cryptographers is the time complexity, but resources could be a bunch of other things that affect the success of an attack. So the data complexity, so how much encrypted data, for example, is available to the attacker, or the memory complexity, and you might look at combinations of these. And then, normally, when we understand how this advantage behaves as a function of the resources, what we want to understand is how many resources are actually needed to, needed to make this advantage substantial or uh, non-negligible. And that's actually a little bit up to the context. Uh, you might have different expectation what that means. Uh, it's not that important. Once you really understand exactly how the advantage behaves, then you can use this in whatever context you want. So, so this is a very uh, distinct view on proving security than the asymptotic view of security that we tend to use in more uh, theoretical works. Um, so here, the security theorem is really an explicit upper bound on the advantage. So we're not telling you here really whether you should be satisfied with a particular function or not. That depends on you. The actual theorem is going to tell you the advantage of the adversary is at most uh, something that we try to characterize as precisely as possible. So for example, ideally, although this is not quite possible without making uh, computational assumptions, you might want to say that for a particular scheme, the advantage of an adversary uh, running in time t is almost, say, t squared over 2 to the 128, right? So that's the type of statement we are after. Uh, when you have something like this, then you can infer certain things. For example, that uh, if you want to make sure that the advantage is always smaller than 2 to the minus 32, for whatever reason you're fixated on the threshold, then you can derive from that theorem that it takes time at least 2 to the 48 to achieve that. So um, again, so this is something that um, probably many of you know, but uh, there's a lot of benefit in giving this type of security theorems. Um, they allow us to, to better understand schemes in the real world, what kind of adversaries they tolerate. They also allow us to compare schemes because a scheme is not just secure or not. Some of them are more secure than others. And also they can guide us to setting parameters because sometimes these bounds are depend on parameters like the length of a key, the size of a block, uh, if it's an encryption scheme, then you can tune them if you have that flexibility and see what impact they have on security. And also, um, again, when you need to certify things, people will actually ask for, for standardization, for example. They will ask for particular security uh, levels in a quantitative way that you could derive uh, from such a theorem and give a guarantee. Um, and so what's the challenge here? Uh, the challenge is that there is some underlying truth, which is really how the advantage grows as a function of the resources. And now we want to prove a theorem, and this theorem should be as precise as possible. I mean, when I say a theorem, a security proof gives us an upper bound. Well, one is an upper bound on the advantage, usually. That's how we normalize advantage. 
could be a probability, then that's not a good theorem. Although it's true that the advantage is upper bounded by one. So we want to have this upper bound to be as exact as possible. And uh, normally what we want is we want to have a matching lower bound, so an attack that shows that you can at least achieve that particular advantage. And then whenever the two match or nearly match, there's always a little bit of cheating in the literature, uh, depending what you need to get your paper accepted. Uh, but uh, normally, if they match, then the bound, you say that the bound is tight. And we are typically after tight bound for some you know, loose understanding of tightness. So uh, as I said, this is actually about specifically indistinguishability. And uh, um, the, um, the particular context uh, we are concerned with in this talk is the one where the advantage, as it is often the case, is not a probability, but it's a measure of a close two interactive objects are. These objects might capture cryptographic security games or interaction with particular cryptographic systems. And so what you have, you have two objects F and G, which are called systems uh, throughout this talk. And we have an advantage that measures how close to each other they are. Typically, we want them to be close for things to be good. And uh, so I have to say that these lights have been very squeezed, so you can see them there. So babies tend to be cuter when they are rounder. So they look very thin here uh, on these slides, but they look cuter on, on the screen. Sorry, never mind. But uh, so the um, so no normally what we have in the cryptographic context, so one object is going to be some real world or something connected to the real world usage of a, of a particular cryptographic primitive, and then G will be typically be some ideal world abstraction of what we want this primitive to behave like, and then the primitive will be good if these two are indistinguishable. And we'll see plenty of examples today. So this is uh, very abstract. Um, and so the way we normally dis define such a metric, there's a few ways of doing it, but the, the, the one we think of as cryptographers is that there's some distinguisher. The distinguisher is going to be given either F or G, say 50-50, and then is asked to guess which one of the two it is actually interacting with. Okay. And we want to measure how hard it is, so we typically want to see how much better than, say, just randomly guessing the distinguisher can do. And um, what, one way to measure this, which is more convenient than this random guessing viewpoint, is to actually assume that the distinguisher will, will output a bit, so say 0, 1. And then uh, we just measure the difference between the probabilities that the distinguisher outputs 1 when interacting with either of the two objects. And some authors like to put absolute values here, and that's what you might have seen or used, but it actually doesn't really matter because we typically maximize the overall distinguishers and you can make this quantity positive without loss of generality. So I don't want to have absolute values there. Right? So that's the type of advantage we're going to care about today and tomorrow. And what we're going to um, actually uh, focus on are techniques to upper bound this advantage in the context when the distinguisher is actually computationally unbounded. And I'll motivate why this is extremely important and why this is often the technical core of many security proofs. Um, so, and it's really a central problem uh, in crypto for the context of this school, but also beyond. And actually many uh, non-trivial and long-standing open questions uh, in uh, cryptographic provable security have been in this space, and they usually tie together with some hard counting or combinatorial questions. And also there have been um, several frameworks uh, over the years dedicated to this type of proofs and with le very hard to access literature. In fact, my experience and the reason why I'm giving these lectures here uh, today uh, is that I sort of had a journey in trying to clean up some of this uh, space and understanding this. And what you'll encounter also is that if you work in symmetric crypto provable security, you're probably very familiar with some of these techniques. For everyone outside, this is like a, a, you know, an obscure terrain where people don't want to venture in. And I want to demystify a little bit uh, this space because there are really some very nice and elegant questions here. Okay. So on that note, um, today um, I'm going to focus on more basic techniques. And again, this, is, this doesn't mean that this stuff is easy. If you see it from the first time, it might exactly not be the case. Uh, but what I mean by that is that I'm mostly going to focus on cleaning up uh, works which is not mine and which has happened over a few decades. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to look more at uh, advanced problems that's more directly connected with my own work and how uh, we went beyond these uh, basic techniques. So um, what I want to do 
uh, to start with is I want to motivate a little bit why uh, we are interested in information theoretic indistinguishability and what I mean by that. So the, the type of questions we, we are going to care about um, as motivation here are mostly not actually information theoretic. They're about building objects that can only have computational security. So the, the prototypical question in this space is to provide construction of pseudo-random functions. Um, so a pseudo-random function, again, what that is, is just a function, a keyed function that depends on a secret key. And the property that you have is that you would like to guarantee that the interaction with this function under a random secret key, so if you can make queries, get the corresponding answer under that key. So you make a query XI, you get the corresponding answer, and distinguisher can do this as long as its computational resources allows uh, them to do that. Um, then the distinguisher should not tell this, uh, the, this apart from, should not be able to tell this apart from a truly random function, so with compatible input-output size. So a function that actually for every input, for every distinct input, returns a truly random output. And so here, security, it's, um, it's a clear case where the security is measured in terms of distinguishing advantages for a particular adversary, for a particular distinguisher adversary, the advantage is the difference between the probabilities that it, the distinguisher outputs one in either of the two worlds. Right? So the good pseudo random function will guarantee that this advantage is small for distinguishers that are as powerful as uh, you, you can actually prove this to be the case. Right, so another example of this, which is important in symmetric crypto, is, uh, is a related notion of a pseudo-random permutation. It's kind of the same thing, except that now the uh, function family is a family of permutation. So for each, fam for each value of the key k, you get, have a permutation from n bits to n bits. And uh, then uh, you're requiring, just to be fair, and we go back into this substantially later, so you're requiring distinguishability from a truly random permutation. So this is, a, um, this is just a function that you can think of it as a function that for each distinct output input returns a random output, but under the constraint that these outputs are distinct, right? Which is what the, um, the actual permutation family also ensures. And then the advantage again is how well you can distinguish. And sometimes we want to do even stronger things. So we're, we have a strong pseudo-random permutation uh, where uh, you can also query the permutations in both directions. Okay. So I assume most of you have seen this, but we are going to use this over and over. So if you have questions, uh, stop me at any time. Okay, so the, the point here is that um, computational, these are inherently computational notions. So it doesn't make sense to ask that something is a pseudo-random function or permutation against all possible distinguishers that run with infinite uh, time uh, resources uh, because they can simply brute force the key space and find the key. I mean, as long as the key is short, you can't expect that. But it does turn out that uh, in many cases, the, the core step in the analysis of such constructions is an information theoretic one where we actually end up proving part of the pr analysis will prove a theorem uh, which will show that some related objects are indistinguishable for distinguishers that are not necessarily bounded in terms of time, but they're only bounded in terms of queries. And again, so that happens because that ends up being an intermediate step in the proof and usually the hardest one. Um, sometimes it also happens because we want to analyze such constructions, but we actually cannot and we analyze them in something we call an ideal model, which is also inherently information theoretic. So I'll give you two examples of historical examples going back to the 80s and the 90s of either types of problems, and these are sort of classical examples of the type of things we look at today. So one first example is the analysis of um, Feistel networks, which actually boils down to the fundamental question, which was studied first by Luby and Rakoff in the 80s, can we actually build a pseudo-random permutation uh, from any pseudo-random function? And does anyone know the solution to this? Okay. Just testing the audience. So, right here. Okay. Right. So, so the, the, the one classical result is that you can use a Feistel network. Um, so that's what, what that means is that, and again, they really look horrible here in this compressed version of the slides. I was really using the widescreen format and didn't realize this would be uh, shrink, shrunk. But um, 
So you have three rounds here, or could we have more in general, if you depends on what a security we want. So where you uh, have this iterator structure, which is a five star network, and at each round you apply this to the random function, and you want to prove that this is computationally indistinguishable from a random permutation, what ends up being the core of this is uh, actually first transitioning to a setting where you use the PRF security of this round function to replace them with random functions, and then you're left actually proving that the Feistel network with truly random function is information theoretically indistinguishable from a truly random permutation. And so again, this is actually the hard part of the proof. I mean, it's not hard by today's standard, but this was actually the core of that, that proof. Um, this part is just standard hybrid argument replacing the uh, pseudo random function uh, r times r is the number around with a truly random function. And here you will actually end up proving a bound on how um, hard it is to tell a Feistel network with a truly, from a truly random permutation apart, and you will prove a quantitative bound, and that's the core of this analysis. So that's the kind of things we want to understand how to prove, so this latter, latter step. Um, another example, which is uh, a classical example in this space, is also related to constructing uh, block ciphers. And that's about the even Mansour construction, which actually answers the following question. So you're given some permutation pi, say pi is from n bits to n bits, and you want to build, which doesn't have any key or anything, and you want to build something which is a good pseudo-random permutation out of that. So you need to sort of add a key to this thing that doesn't have a key, and then all hope that under suitable properties of this permutation, what you build is really pseudo-random under a secret key. And so what even Mansour uh, proposed is this very simple construction where what they do is they think of the secret key as being made of two n-bit key parts, and there is an input here x, and then you just XOR the first half of the key to the input, apply the permutation, get the output, XOR the key again, and then you get the final output. And now you would like to prove that under suitable assumption on pi, this is a good pseudorandom permutation. Turns out we don't know how to do this, so it's probably not even possible by uh, our understanding of provable security uh, nowadays. So what you instead do, and what even Mansour did, is they said, well, let's at least try to show that there are no inherent weaknesses in this construction in terms of generic attacks. So let's assume that this pi inside the construction is actually randomly chosen, so it's a randomly chosen permutation as well, and let's try to prove security in an ideal model where everyone has access to this permutation, in particular the adversary, it's randomly chosen and it's used inside the construction. So, so what that concretely means in terms of indistinguishability is that if we are showing that two worlds are indistinguishable, one world is that you can, oops, you can either query the even Mansour construction under the secret keys and get the resulting output. You can in fact do that in both directions. And this construction will inside use a random permutation that you can also query directly. So that's one world, that's your F, and you're comparing it with another world, your G, where instead of querying the even Mansour construction, you're going to query a truly random permutation which is independent of the pi. So you actually have two things you're querying in each one of the two worlds, two type of queries. In fact, you have four because you can query each one of them backward and forward. And, but you want to show that these two worlds are indistinguishable. And it turns out that here it doesn't, make, it doesn't help you to restrict the power of the adversary in terms of time. You can really prove indistinguishability in terms of just the number of queries the adversary can make, ignoring time. And that's another common scenario where um, such uh, information theoretic analysis come up. And in fact, um, there's a whole line of work that uh, sort of plagued, the, in a good way, the cryptographic community for uh, in the 2010s and so on, which was in trying to understand the security of generalization of the even Mansour construction, which is what we call a key alternating cipher. So there's just a multi-round version. And there were um, several works, and this is not meant to be read, but we'll go back to that uh, tomorrow, um, where increasingly better bounds on the advantage of an adversary in distinguishing this construction from a truly random function. So if the security is a random permutation were proved with all sorts of different techniques. And the interesting thing about this problem was that it was really 
sort of one of those problems that push developing newer techniques and better techniques that allowed us to understand these proofs uh, better and better. Right, but, but the base, basic point here is that, and you, you're not meant to read this, but the basic point that even this question, this problem, what you have is you have some very complicated objects that where you can make queries and uh, ideally, if you are like me, you might want to have them described in terms of pseudocode like you have a bunch of interfaces, there's a state which consists of some randomly chosen permutation and keys and you can make different types of queries and now you would like to prove concretely uh, how well you can distinguish these uh, two worlds apart uh, in a quantitative way. And so that's just an instance of this general question. So what we want to talk about now is what kind of general techniques are available if we are given two such interactive objects to show that they are indistinguishable and to give a quantitative bound on how indistinguishable they are. So, and again, this is one motivation and it's natural to find motivations in symmetric cryptography because it's where we inherently care about these kind of questions, but such questions really come up all over the place, okay. So are there any questions uh, up to this point? Anything you're confused about or anything else you wanna know? Okay, Good. all right. So now I'll become a little bit more um, technical now and I want to give you concretely now uh, some, develop some tools on how to prove such theorems at the more abstract level. And so what I want to do now is I really want to give you something which is not, which is detached from this particular application. So this is going to be um, a little bit dry. But one reason I want to do this is that this presentation, and if you worked on it, you might appreciate this, is really uh, much cleaner than much of the stuff you're going to find in the, uh, in the literature, and that might, might help you really understand uh, what's going on here. So one first basic question I, I want to um, address here is how to formalize the question to start with. So we want to show indistinguishability of these general interactive objects and I want to introduce a formalism for describing these interactive objects which is sort of independent of much of the details that you might have as a preference in how to describe them. And so here there, 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 there have been several attempts to do this and one that actually works quite well in what I'm trying to do today is to use uh, the random system um, uh, formalism uh, by Maurer that was introduced in 2002. And it's sort of like seen as something rather obscure, but this is mostly because of the underlying framework and things that are done there. Uh, I wanna use it in the most basic form here just to characterize the objects we are talking about. Right, so the, the basic thing we want to formalize now, we wanna formalize first of all what does it mean to have um, an interactive object that we can ask queries to and get answers from? Then we wanna formalize what it means to actually interact with it in form of a distinguisher and then how do we measure distance uh, between two objects, right? That's what we are using this language for. When you actually want to apply it, uh, you might probably describe these objects in a more humanly readable way, for example, by using pseudocode. But when we want to make ma mathematical statements about them, uh, there's a lot of stuff which is unnecessary in this higher level description and random system gives you the minimal uh, formalization for that. So what is a random system? Right, again, it's a, just a mathematical model to describe the general interactive object that takes queries and gives you responses and it's probabilistic. And uh, this system might have a state and might you know, work in very different ways, but all we care about is the input output behavior. And the way we formalize this is as a family of function so for every uh, integer, i, positive integer, there's a different function pi. Um, this is actually in particular models a system that might go on forever. If your system only answer at most q queries, then you can stop at q. You don't need to define the functionality forever. But what these individual functions do is they describe how the system answers the i query, okay? And this answer, of course, might generally depend on the past behavior. And so specifically what these functions describe is how the system behaves in the i query as a function of the interaction so far. So to make you a little bit more familiar with the notation, so for a system f, and again formally, f is just a family of such functions, so these functions will have take the formal following form. So x is the set of inputs, y is the set of outputs. 
And each function, so the i function will take a sequence of i inputs and a sequence of i minus 1 outputs plus an extra output. It's helpful to separate them for reason you'll see in a second. And just returns a real number between 0 and 1 here. And the way you should interpret this is that if you fix an interaction, so I'll use this notation x superscript i and y superscript y minus 1 to mean some arbitrary sequence of i inputs and uh, y uh, minus 1 outputs. So if you fix any i inputs and y minus i, I outputs, so what it means is we fix the interaction up to the i query. So I've seen, I made i queries and I've seen the first i minus 1 outputs and I want to understand the behavior of the i query. So what I get now is that this function is going to give me for each such partial interaction up to the i query is going to give me a probability distribution over the response to the i query. So the function has the property that's the only constraint that for every such partial interaction for every xi and yi minus 1, the sum over all little y, so all possible answers to the i queries, so if you take the sum of pi, you're going to get 1. So it's a value probability distribution. Right? And again, the way you interpret this is that for any possible partial interaction that you have, if you get to that point, you make a query to the system, you're going to, if that's what you've seen so far, and then the i query is in here, you're going to get answer y with that probability. Right? So it's clear that this is modeling a general object. So in particular, you don't have to think about what the state internal is. If there's an internal state or something, it will just define some uh, such a family. So yeah, questions? Um, yeah, so you're talking about the, like the, the, the probability that you're having certain output condition, condition on the past, in a sense. Right. So I'm actually surprised that you're not considering the conditional expectation of y given xi and y i minus 1 and then analyzing the probability distribution of this new var random variable. Oh, so it's, it's not a conditional expectation. It is a probability <laughs> distribution. It's just that it's written in a bit of a weird way in a sense that, so p itself is not a probability distribution, but once you fix this part, so you fix the first two arguments, and you leave the third one open, then it is a probability distribution. What I'm writing there is just a normalization constraint that it is a probability distribution. Okay, then, then. Okay, does it make sense? Or? No, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think that's exactly what you were. Yeah, that's important to digest the notation. It is a little bit weird that it's written like this. But the point is that, yeah, for every partial interaction, for every query, for every partial interaction up to the query, you have a different probability distribution that gives you uh, for the answer to that query. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is this um, basically a model of computation that captures all of, like, uh, probabilistic behaviors from this object that we are trying to model? Yeah, so you can turn it into a model of computation, right? So in the sense that if you think about an automaton, right, this corresponds to the description of an automaton. I'm not giving yet an execution of the semantics of how I run it, but absolutely, yeah. Okay. Uh, you could just think of it that way. So, you know, for, for every possible interaction, like you're at this point, you make the query, look at this number, and, you know, sample, sample according to the distribution, and that's your model. Right. Perfect, thank yeah. you. Exactly. Right, so, so for example, if you want to define, or oh, was there more question? Okay, so if you want to define a, a random function uh, in this language, and by the way, we, we are not going to really do it all the time. It's just there because I want to give you theorems and I want to give a mathematical meaning to these theorems. Uh, you will reason uh, in terms of your favorite way of thinking about it, but it's good to make this mapping, right? So for example, for a truly random function from n bits to n bits, so n bit inputs, n bit outputs, right? So how do we describe it as a random system? So the way you do that is that you are going to, for every sequence of i inputs and prior i minus 1 outputs, which without loss of generality, this must be a, a meaningful interaction. So what that means is that if prior you ask two queries that were the same, you also got the same answer. Otherwise, we don't care because this interaction will never happen. We'll see concretely what that means. But uh, it's natural to expect that I don't care about inconsistent interaction. And so for every interaction up to the point, now I want to just define the answer to the i query. And uh, we know that it's uniform because it's a truly random function. And so the way we formalize this is that we say, well, there's two cases really. One of them, if this is a new query that I haven't made before, then every y is equally likely, you know, given the interaction up to this point. So they are all taken with probability 1 over 2 to the n. And if the 
a query is not new, so there was a prior query, then I have to answer consistently as well. And so uh, what that means is that for that particular Y, there was already a return before. So we are looking at query XI. If there's an XJ, which was queried before, and it was the same, then we answer the same, we need to answer YJ. And so what that means in terms of probability distribution is that YJ is gonna take probability one and the rest is gonna take probability zero. Right. So that sort of answers also the question you were asking before, the way we mean it, right? And for a random permutation, so it's a similar story, except that now we have a slightly different distribution. So if we make a new query, now what do we need to have here? Well, we need to distinguish again two cases. If the query is new, then the output is going to be random, but it's going to be distinct from everything which has been returned before. So what we look at is we, we look at the set of prior answers, and let's assume that the number of distinct queries so far was k. So there were k outputs that were consumed that I can't use anymore. So now I have two to the minus, two to the n minus k remaining possible output. And so each y that is still possible will be taken with probability one over two to the n minus k. Every y which is not possible will not be taken, so the probability is zero. And again, if the query is not new, then you have to answer it consistently. So this is just to convince you with the two simplest examples that you can write down every, you know, systems in this way. And uh, these are two such examples. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if the microphone, okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can hear you, but uh, other people cannot, yeah. Uh, so the functions pi must depend on all the previous queries, not just xi and yi minus one. Right, so it's, it's, a, it's a quantification for all of them, right? So, so mm. for, each, for each xi, for each y, one, oh yeah, so maybe that's what you were asking is about the notation, right? So when I write this, um, Superscript, I really mean vectors of all prior queries, right? So, and I'm all saying right. for, for each one of them, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah. that ensures. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. All right, so um, the other thing, right, so once we have this in place, is that we also want to formalize what a distinguisher is that interact with, a, uh, with, an, with, with such a system. And that actually can be done exactly in the same way because the distinguisher is also some sort of interactive object it's just sort of one query ahead, right? So or behind, depending on how you look at it, right? So you can define as well for every partial interaction the distinguisher has seen, what is the probability that a particular next query is going to be made? And the way you do that is just by shifting things around. So for every i for the i query, again, the, the distinguisher up to this point have, has made i minus one queries, has seen i minus one answer, and now for each query x it will make as the i query, there is a certain probability of doing it. Um, just for notational conveniences, I like to think of distinguishers as being tied with a particular number of queries, Q. So I talk about a Q query distinguisher. So here I just define a finite number of functions, so Q of them for the queries. But really things are just very similar. In fact, I, I want to point out that that's not clear from Maurer's paper, but this language is not really new. So if you have encountered things from communication complexity and you want to describe interactive protocols in a very formal but minimalistic way, the formalism is very similar. So the interaction between a distinguisher and a system is nothing but a two-party protocol uh, between two entities. And that's how these kind of things are formalized. Okay? So, good. So I, I want to point out here that I introduced distinguishing before in terms of outputting a bit after you interact. I want to actually make this explicit because we're talking about information theoretic distinguishers today and we can just assume that the bit at the end is almost chosen optimally. So I will just ignore this part and we'll see how this is formalized without having an actual bit. So in case you're wondering why this distinguisher doesn't output bits is because it won't be really necessary. So okay, the final thing now is how do we put the two together? Um, so the distinguisher and the system have been formalized. Now I want to define an actual execution that comes back to your question of model of computation. So I want to define what it means for the two to actually interact. So the way we'll think about it is that the interaction will produce a transcript of queries with the corresponding answers. And that's just a random variable consisting of inputs and outputs that will have a particular distribution.
And the way we define that is just by multiplying probabilities out, right? So we're gonna just look, let's look at the probability that the distinguisher makes the first query x1, then let's multiply it by the probability that given x1, the system will respond with y1, then given his interaction so far, what's the probability the distinguisher makes uh, query x2, and so on. And so you obtain just this product of these probabilities, and that's the probability that a particular transcript uh, is going to be generated in an interaction between D and F. And that's the probability that this particular tau is, is generated. So that's actually the random variable we are going to consider. And it's going to have a well-defined distribution that depends on this sort of uh, probabilities that define the random system and the distinguisher. Okay, and that's what we're going to study uh, now. Okay, so now, now we wanna measure advantage here uh, in this framework. And one way to do this, which is going to be very helpful also for the following discussions, is to not to do really much, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't define something that the new things that have already been there forever. We can just use basic tools from probability and realize that they capture already what we want. And so one first tool is that the traditional way to define distance of uh, distributions or of random variables associated with these distributions is to just use one existing metric from information theory. So the most natural one for now is going to be uh, total variation distance, which is also often known as statistical distance, although that's a stupid name because it's not very descriptive because every statistical distance is statistical, so there's many of them. So usually the right name will be total variation or at one distance which basically measures the area between the corresponding probability uh, distributions and then divides it by two. Another way to think about it, in fact, is that you can show that you can just look at the area where one of the two, say P, is above Q, and that's also the statistical distance, or look at the area here in green where the other one is above, so they're, always, they're also the same as the statistical distance. So the, the green area and the red area are exactly identical. If you sum and divide it by two, of course, you get the same. And um, the, the, the one reason why statistical distance, so total variation distance is good for us is that it has a natural um, operational interpretation in terms of distinguishing. So if I sample uh, uh, an element from either distribution and then give it to a distinguisher and define the advantage as before, the best distinguishing advantage is the statistical, as the total variation distance. So that's why we wanna capture that. And then it becomes exactly natural to just say that if I have two different systems and I wanna measure the advantage of a particular distinguisher, what I can do in purely statistical terms, I define the interactions with either of the two systems, random variables, we just defined them two slides ago, and then I just look at their uh, statistical distance in terms of total variation, and that's the advantage. So for any two systems F and G, and any compatible distinguisher, I just look at the two transcript statistical distance that's our advantage for that distinguisher. Now, it's important here that uh, to realize that that's not exactly how I define advantage before and that's not exactly how you see this in most crypto textbooks, but for uh, information theoretic distinguisher, it's really equivalent. So it really captures, so even if I just allow the distinguisher to interact and output a decision bit, um, you know, that statistical distance here captures the fact that this distinguisher outputs the best possible decision bit up to that point. Okay, so that's the quantity we want to upper bound now. So the type of problems we look for are given an F and a G that I could describe like this, and I want to prove for particular distinguishers that are given a certain number of queries, an upper bound on this advantage. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So, yeah. uh, so where is Q here, like the number of queries? Yeah, Q, you, good point. So here, um, so that this went lost. So this should be a, a Q query distinguisher. And then the way that, where does it land? It lands implicitly in the definition of the transcript that it's only up to Q query. Yeah. So the advantage, it doesn't depend on Q, like the notation. Well, the advantage depends implicitly on Q in a sense that here, the distinguisher will have a certain number of query Q and typically the more, the larger the Q, the more the advantage will grow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, what, one important point is that about distinguishers is that often we can simplify the problem significantly by actually only looking at distinguishers that are deterministic. So what does it mean to be deterministic? It really means that at every step, given the interaction so far, there is one particular query 
that is going to be output with probability one and all of the rest of probability zero, right? Which given the normalization constraints we had before is the same as just requiring that these numbers are either zero or one. Okay, exactly what you will expect. And there's an interesting fact here, and that's actually the, the first important fact for the, uh, the proofs I'm going to give next on how to prove indistinguishability. And it looks rather silly at this point, but it's actually something that has confused many of us when we encounter these type of uh, problems uh, formally for the first time, is that if your distinguisher is, uh, so this is really for any deterministic D only, if your distinguisher is deterministic and I want to see what's the probability that we get a particular transcript, then just by the formula I gave you before, so this, uh, this formula here that I gave you before, then there's really two things that can happen because the probability on the distinguisher side are all either zero or one. So what that happens is that either on the left hand side, you have all of them are one and then this product on the left hand side is one and then you're left with the product on the right hand side that only depends on f. Or uh, one of the terms here is zero, so this interaction, this transcript is not consistent with what a distinguisher will actually do, and then uh, this uh, probability is zero. And again, I'm taking this really through the brutal path where you don't know where I'm going, so this looks rather dry as a fact, but we'll see why this is helpful. So, so the point is that whenever I look at a particular transcript and the probability that that transcript occurs, uh, for a deterministic distinguisher, it's always either zero because that transcript will never be generated by that distinguisher, or it is some quantity that only depends on f but not on the distinguisher. So it's the product of these probabilities uh, corresponding to the transcript but only on the system side. And that's something that we often refer to as the uh, interpolation probability. And I'll write it like this uh, for a particular transcript. So that is basically a probability which by itself has nothing to do with the distinguisher. It's just saying, hey, you have a transcript with input and outputs. You have a system. Let's imagine that you ask this query non-adaptively. And, so and then what's the probability that the corresponding outputs are consistent with the transcript? And uh, the, the interesting thing about this probability is that in many cases, these probabilities are actually totally order invariant. So for example, for a random function, uh, really, if I have a sequence of inputs and outputs, if I reorder them, uh, the product of this probability is always going to be the same. And in fact, for most cryptographic systems of interest, this probability is really order invariant, and it's mostly a counting problem to just count, uh, to just compute that probability. And is, you don't have to consider the distinguisher or anything. And again, what I assumed here implicitly is that we can actually, um, without loss of generality, um, just assume that a distinguisher is deterministic because you can always show, you might have seen this elsewhere, that an information theoretic adversary is deterministic just by fixing the optimal randomness. And so uh, we can look at such distinguisher. And the final thing before we take a two minute break uh, is, and then we're gonna work with this, is uh, there is a useful simplification of the advantage that we're going to use to derive some theorems, which is that if we actually now fix a distinguisher, and now we want to compute its advantage, what we can do is we can use the definition of statistical distance in a clever way. And first of all, remember that when I told you what's the statistical distance, I told you, well, what you can do is you can just look at the places where one distribution is above the other one and just compute the area between the two, and then you can show that it's equal to the statistical distance. So let's do that. Let's say that, so we have distinguisher D plus F and G. We look at the transcript when interacting with G, the transcript when interacting with F, and then we look at all taus where one transcript takes that particular tau with higher probability than the other one. And we know now that the advantage is going to be exactly that area difference, so we just sum over all such taus the difference of the probabilities. And now I just wanna use the theorem I used before plus a little fact that you might, you might catch me cheating here or not and say, well, I can actually rewrite this in this way, which seems silly, but it's actually quite powerful. We're now, instead of looking at the random experiment where I have the distinguisher and uh, the system, I just write this in terms of this interpolation probability that do not depend on the distinguisher, uh, using the fact I had before. 
And then uh, the sum, however, which tau's I'm going to sum over, that one will depend on the distinguisher because these are the tau's that are in this set and that depends on the distinguisher. And we'll see how this is useful after uh, a two minutes break, but maybe uh, one of you has caught me cheating here or sees where there could be a problem, but maybe not. Yeah, so, so one issue here is that it could be that, uh, you know, this is larger than zero for sure if it's in this set, and this could be zero, right? And so it, it's not necessarily clear if this is zero by the, the statement I made before that this equality really holds. Uh, but you can think as a little exercise why that's the case. It's actually just follows from the definition we had before. Okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe I missed this in the definition, but um, do you define a transcript to always be response terminated? Sorry, I just the fan is running. Yeah. I was wondering if a transcript is always response terminated. So like the output, the last part is always Y. And if not, would your definition yeah, of uh, interpolation probability still hold? Because So you're, you're saying what if the last uh, query is not answered or something like that? Right. Like what if the last part of the transcript is actually a query, like an input from the from the distinguisher? then does the definition of interpolation probability still make sense? Yeah, so, so again, now here in this definition, I assume it always ends with an answer, but you could, uh, if you add such situation, you will have either to tweak the definition or simply to assume that you know, the final response is a bot symbol or something like that, and then you could incorporate it here. So you could have a special symbol, right, that says I'm done, right, if you want, and then it will follow from this. But I was wondering if you're looking at partial transcripts, can you still say that the probability is independent of the distinguisher? Um, if you look at partial transcript, uh, depends what you mean by partial transcript. But I think the interesting thing here is that you don't have to, right? So you, these are really only full transcript, right? So they all go until the end. So that's, that's helpful, actually, for what we want to do. So you don't have to actually worry about that, but yeah. OK, thanks. OK, don't you, yeah. OK, so this was actually kind of tough because there was no motivation. So, um, but we'll see an example. So I like in my classes to always have like something which is some sort of brain break. So you stare at something cute for like 30 seconds and then, uh, and you case that you didn't know that's actually a red panda, which is not an actual panda, but uh, it's, you know. so anyways, uh, it's time for cooling off. And then what we wanna do now, uh, after you're, when you're ready, is I wanna, we wanna actually use this formalism. And the first thing I wanna do, I wanna use this formalism to give you a super simple proof of a basic crypto 101 fact, which is the switching lemma that proves that a random permutation and a random function are uh, indistinguishable. And I just wanna show you how it basically follows with a few lines just from the formalism I introduced so far, which is actually something I haven't really seen in the literature. Um, okay, so switching lemma. So um, what we want to show now is we want to show that if I give you a random function or a random permutation, then you cannot really tell them apart except with advantage, which is basically the probability of uh, seeing a collision in the outputs of a random function. And uh, it's sort of really the simplest type of information, uh, information theoretic indistinguishability you will normally see in a crypto class. It's actually surprisingly tricky. So there's a paper by Ballard and Rogaway that introduces the game playing framework, actually points out that a few of the proofs in the literature are actually wrong. I mean, it's for fairly technical reasons, but uh, it's actually harder to formalize if you are precise than you would think. And there's a few more papers on trying to uh, give formal proofs that are actually correct. So I wanna just give you one here, which is a bit different than the ones that you find in the literature and just follows basically from what I wrote uh, before, this formalism, right? And so we, we're just gonna plug in numbers and see that by magic uh, we get what we want. So again, so here our f and g are going to be respectively the random function and the random permutation. Somehow the order actually matters uh, how we do it. And we have some distinguisher d that makes q queries. So q is fixed. Again, we only look at complete distinguisher. The transcript, which by the way, coming back to your question, that ends up being the problem in some of the proof, the fact that you have to consider non-partial uh, uh, transcript. So, so here, uh, what we're gonna do is, we're just gonna compute these interpolation probabilities. And what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna look at some transcript that could potentially occur. Um, in fact, so, so if I define it like this as a transcript that, yeah, so could occur in the experiment, but it doesn't even matter too much, uh, 
as long as it's a transcript that makes sense. So it has consistent, uh, consistency. If you ask the query twice, you get the same answer. And now what we want to see is what these interpolation probabilities are. So, so for the random function, so what I do here, so this Q prime is just the actual number of distinct queries I'm asking. So there are uh, uh, Q prime potential output. And again, I haven't written here, but I'm assuming consistency. So xi equal xj implies yy equal yj. So you have Q prime distinct inputs, Q prime distinct outputs. So the probability that the interpolation probability from the transcript is exactly one over n to the Q prime. So n, sorry, here big N is two to the small n. I don't think it's written anywhere, but that's what I mean by that. It's n bit output. So that's just because, again, there are n potential degree of, uh, so Q prime potential degree of freedom. Each one of them is uh, two to the n options. That's what you get. And from the random permutation, it's very similar, but you have to take into account the fact that these outputs are distinct. So you have uh, n choices for the first one, n minus one for the second one. So you get this falling product of Q prime terms uh, in your denominator, right? So these are the interpolation probabilities. Like very simple to compute. You don't have to think about the distinguisher. That's it. And now how do we prove a bound on the advantage? Well, we just compute in this formalism. So we have this formula we derived before. We have the expression for these two interpolation probabilities. But before I do that, it's actually convenient to do this little transformation here where I sort of take the probability for one of the two systems G out and then I factor it out. So I'm left with one minus the ratio of the remaining probabilities. And uh, then I just plug in numbers. So now what I'm going to do is I, I, I know what these two uh, probabilities are. And it turns out that if you actually do the math, right? So here you had this like, um, so actually let me, you go back to the definition, right? Uh, you know what F and G are. So now you can just plug them in. And what you get is actually this expression which is this product of one minus one over n, uh, i over n for all i's from zero to q prime. And again, note that this q prime is a quantity that depends on the transcript. So it could be a variable number. And now what is this number? Well, it turns out that this is exactly the probability that q prime uh, elements that are uniformly drawn are distinct. It happens to be exactly what we want. And so one minus that is exactly the probability that you have a collision among a Q prime uniformly drawn element, which is exactly the collision probability, which is exactly, as you might know, by a simple union bound is Q prime squared divided by 2n. And then uh, this Q prime is upper bounded by the number of actual queries you can make at most. So it's Q squared over 2n. And you're done because actually, if now you write it like this, you can put this out. And here, you're left with the sum. Now, it's a little bit confusing here. You actually have to think more than you would like to, because that's actually where many people do mistakes. But uh, you realize that these are, are interpolation probabilities that are defined for every transcript. They do not need to sum up to one. But it so happened that this was exactly the probability that the transcript of the distinguisher will take a value tau. So these are summing up to one. And so you're left with Q squared over to do the end. Actually, a most one, right? So, and that's, that's what you get. So, so again, so what we have done here, where's the magic? Uh, two things. The first one is that we have taken out this probability to basically have an average, and then realize that if we plug in number in this one minus a ratio expression, what we get is exactly the collision probability, just by straight computation. And then uh, once you average things out and factor the Q squared over 2n out, you're left exactly with the collision probability. And that's it. Uh, you don't have to use any fancy framework. It's really proved at the level of basic uh, probability distribution. So like no game playing, random system, whatever, each coefficient is just at this level. If you know what these terms mean, okay? And again, so this is, uh, you know, one way how you can see already that these basic formalities can help you have some insights. Um, it turns out, however, that this approach is not sufficient to solve any sort of problems that uh, we encounter. And that's actually the, the main idea behind the uh, H coefficient uh, technique, which is something that you might have heard of. And at least when I started, 
my PhD, there was no very nice cleanup of this. In fact, Jacques Paterin, who proposed this, his thesis was in French and was not even available on the web, so there was no good write-up of this. So it was quite unclear, but it has meanwhile been cleaned up, and the nice thing is that it fits exactly within this formal framework uh, in a very natural way. So basically, what, what's the idea? So one way to reformulate uh, what I just did before with the switching lemma is that we had expressed the advantage as the average of this weird one minus a ratio of interpolation probability, and we had shown that it's upper bounded by some explicit epsilon. And then what we have seen is then, then what you get as advantage is just the average of this epsilon, so you get epsilon. And that's how we proved an upper bound, right? So we compute epsilon, we had seen that in our example, this epsilon was exactly the collision probability, and that's how we got epsilon. That's, that's what we did, abstractly. And it turns out that for quite a few problems, you can't get away with this, but only with an approximation of this. Namely, what happens is that you can only do this, but for a fraction of the transcript. So, so you look at the space of all possible Q-query transcripts that might ever occur, and you can also be sort of generous in this. As long as you include those that will occur in the experiment, even if you overdo it, it's not a big deal in the definition, as long as those that can actually occur are in this big uh, green uh, circle. And then what you do is you partition them into two sets of bad transcript and good transcripts. Now, what, what does this partition mean? Well, it means that, first of all, for the good transcripts, you can actually do what we've done before. So you are able to come up with an epsilon that bounds that weird function for which we take the average. So one minus the ratio of the interpolation probability for all transcripts in the good set can be upper bounded by some epsilon. Sometimes authors like to write as the, the, the transcript is larger equal one minus epsilon. It's a matter of aesthetics, but I like to think of this because you know where it's coming from, from the derivation we had before. Uh, and then the other thing is that you show, well, for the other transcripts, you can do that, but we can actually show that those transcripts are not likely to occur. And very importantly here, things are absolutely not symmetric. So there is an order of things. So the ratio is F over G. And the probability that a transcript occurs is in the bet set. We are going to upper bound it for transcripts that occur when interacting with G. So the probability that a transcript occurs that is bad is at most delta when interacting with G. And the ratio F over G is at least 1 minus epsilon. If you can assess that, then the distinguishing advantage is at most epsilon plus delta. I'm not going to actually even prove it because it's really just expanding that equation we had before. It's just that you chop off those terms for which you don't have an upper bound and see that they count at most for this probability. And so that's the H coefficient method. Um, so it was not clear that that's what it was, I think, from the original write-ups, but there was a nice write-up by uh, Chen and Steinberger, which is not yet as general in their Eurocrypt 14 paper. And, and actually, for a reason I don't understand, maybe Itai or get to, some of you know the story, but Nandi has a paper from Indocrypt where he actually basically formalized something similar as Chen and Steinberger, but never got credit for it. And it doesn't seem to even take credit. So this kind of you know, reformalization have come up, but basically that's what it is. And um, now I want to give you an example where we can apply this as the one big uh, example for today, which is the um, analysis of the even Mansour construction. And again, if you go back and look at the original paper, so the, the paper is even older, but there's a journal version from 97, which is originally cited, uh, you will appreciate that the proof there is much more complicated. And even later proofs that were using other frameworks, like Bellari Rogowitz game playing technique, are, are pretty complex. But I want to show you how you can give a fairly simple proof of their theorem using uh, the H coefficient method. And um, next time, we're actually going to see that once you try to generalize this theorem, then the H coefficient method will start to fail. And we'll see how to deal with that. Uh, but for today, we stick to good news. All right, so in fact, I'm going to analyze a single key variant of the even Mansour construction, which as far as I know, uh, was not in an earlier paper. And the first paper I know that deals with it explicitly is a paper by Duncan, Keller, and Shamir from Eurocrypt 12. 
They also have an ad hoc proof, which is way more complicated than what I'm going to do today. In fact, you will see that one key, two keys doesn't, it's easy to see that they're all the same in the proof I'm going to give you. And so what we want to show now is that we are in a setting where the underlying permutation is random. It's available as an oracle to the adversary. And for simplicity, I'm going to write it only in terms of one parameter. So the adversary can make Q queries total that uh, they can distribute between the construction query, so to the construction under a secret key, both forward and backward, or to the underlying permutation directly, both forward and backward. So there are these two types of queries, and the, you want to distinguish from a random permutation to the setting where you replace this whole thing with a truly random permutation independent of pi. And we are going to show that the advantage is at most q squared over 2 to the n plus 1. So n here is the input length of the permutation and the length of the key. So formally, really, I mean, for humans, if you don't think of that as uh, random systems, so we are considering distinguishing these two systems. So one world, again, this is just what I said, but more formally. So one world, you pick a permutation, you can pick a key. You can query the permutation pi forward or backwards. Or you can do what I call here an encryption or decryption query. So either you query the even Mansour construction forward or backwards. Right? That's the real world. The ideal world is uh, you pick an additional random permutation p, and the encryption decryption queries are answered by this independent permutation p. Now I want to show a bound on the advantage of distinguishing these two of q squared divided by 2 to the n plus 1. In fact, I'm going to do something slightly uh, to the adversary's advantage. I'm going to actually imagine that uh, the final step of the interaction is going to be some finalization step where very generously the adversary is going to learn the key. Uh, which seems absurd, um, except that you realize that it's, it happens at the end and the adversary cannot make any queries to confirm that this key is good for anything. So we will show that actually this won't help, but it will make the proof much, more e much easier. And of course, in the ideal world, in G, there is no key. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to output just a bogus uh, string, which is a random key independent of everything which has happened so far. I hope the adversary doesn't notice. So I'm calling this f hat and g hat, so I'm going to show that the bound we want is actually the indistinguishability bound for f hat and g hat. Of course, if that's the case, we get the bound we wanted for the pseudo-random permutation security because I'm only giving more information than what the adversary will learn when uh, interacting with, a, with the actual real world and ideal world. Okay? So let's prove that. So we want to use the h coefficient method. So the first thing uh, we want to do is we want to understand what transcripts are here, right? And so as we've seen, there are four types of queries, right? So you can evaluate the permutation forward, backwards, or you can encrypt or you can decrypt. Okay. So these are the four types of queries. So a transcript will contain queries of that type. And then um, they will have an output. So xi is going to be a type of the query and what the output is, yi is the corresponding output. And here I'm going to go back to the question you were asking and kind of implicitly extend in the formalism because here I know that the for last query, it's actually, uh, there's no last query, but the adversary learns the key at the end. So that works. You can extend things easily. I'm doing it a bit un, you know, under the rug here. So I'm going to add simply the key k to the transcript. That's the final thing the adversary learns. And um, one important thing to express things more succinctly is that actually for this proof, uh, the fact that queries are made forward or backwards doesn't matter from a counting point of view to compute probabilities. So it turns out that all I care about are the input-output pairs for permutation queries and for encryption-decryption queries. So whenever there's a permutation queries to pi, u that gives me a v, or an inverse query for v that gives me a u, I just add uv to this set pi of transcript. And then this p of transcript is the same thing for encryption decryption query. If I encrypt x and get y, I add xy. If I decrypt y and get x, I also add xy. So that's, that's the main uh, combinatorial object we are looking at. And what I want to do now, which is sort of intuitive, but maybe not if you haven't seen such proofs before, I want to now make, give a definition of which transcript I consider to be bad. So I want to partition out these transcripts to use the H coefficient method. And when is a transcript bad? Well, it's bad when I manage to make a query, say an encryption query, for a particular X, 
that results inside, inside the evaluation into making a query u to pi by, after you add the secret key, which I don't see directly until the very end. So at that point, when I ask for x, I don't know the key. And it happens that I'm lucky, the resulting little u that I get after adding the key happens to be a little u that was involved in a direct query to the permutation or that will be involved in a direct query to the permutation. So basically what it means is that there exists a u and a v in pi of tau of the transcript and an x, y in p of tau such that if I add k to x, I'm going to get u or if I get k to y, I'm going to get v. Note that this R is important because in the real world, these are equivalent. In the ideal world, they're they not necessarily uh, equivalent. So, so it could be either of the two could happen, but they don't have to happen at the same time. So now I define this good uh, and bad notion. So a transcript is either bad if it satisfies this or it's good. So now we want to apply the H coefficient method. So we want to prove two things. We want to prove that for all good transcripts, so those that do not satisfy this condition, there is an upper bound epsilon. And also, I want to prove that the probability that we generate a bad transcript in the ideal world, so with g hat, is upper bounded by some delta. And hopefully, epsilon plus delta, it better be what our theorem claims it to be. OK? So let's do the first thing. So let's look at this ratio of probability. So that's where I told you for today, uh, we do only very basic combinatorics. Um, so here we just compute probability, so very basic counting. So again, f hat is the real world. And now our transcript tau is good. So there are no such weird overlaps, right? So all of these x1, y1 are either encryption, decryption, or are uh, permutation to pi, forward or backwards but we have this property that there are no such overlap, right? So what does it really mean, right? So it means that the what, what it really means is that every query you make is going to be associated uniquely with one input output pair for the permutation. So if we have an encryption query, so for every x, y in the set pi, uh, p of tau, there is some underlying x, x or k, y, x or k, that the permutation little pi needs to be consistent with. And you know, for every uv in little in pi of tau, then the permutation needs to be consistent with uv, right? So the permutation that is being chosen for this tau to for the system to be consistent with this tau, so pi needs to be consistent with this and with this for any such pair induced by the transcript. And because the transcript is good, these pairs are not going to be overlapping. And if now I call like QP the number of pairs defined by pi, P tau, Q pi those defined by uh, P of tau, now I can just basically compute the probability, right? Because I'm going to have a one over n here. That's simply the probability that a particular key occurs. I have to take that into account. And then times the probability that the underlying permutation is consistent with all of these input output pairs the permutation needs to be consistent with. And they're exactly qp plus q pi many that I need to be consistent with. So I get this product with falling n from n, n minus 1, n minus 2. And I have qp plus q pi points I need to be consistent with. So any question? That's actually the hardest part of the proof. Believe me or not. Actually, second hardest, maybe. But OK. Um, so now, what's the, what happens with the ideal world so here it's kind of interesting because I'm actually answering encryption queries and direct queries to pi with two independent permutations. So the, the, the encryption decryption queries do not define um, any um, uh, input output pairs that the permutation little pi needs to satisfy. It's the permutation big P that need to be consistent with them, but these are two independent permutations. So what that means in terms of probability is that now I actually have two products, one for the values p needs to be consistent with, and the other one is for the values that pi needs to be consistent with. Right? So they're independent. So what that really means is that when I compute this product, I sort of restart from n, right? Because I have 
Q pi input output pairs that pi needs to be consistent with, and, and then QP ones that P needs to be consistent with, but they're independent. So now I have these two products, uh, and I restart from N, okay? And then one over N again for the probability. So what you notice now, uh, that's actually the interpolation probability for F hat is always larger equal than the one for G hat. Uh, this is a bit confusing, you have to convince yourself that so here the numbers are going to become smaller than here in the denominator, so that's why you have that. What that actually means is that one minus the ratio is actually smaller equals zero. So it's, 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 it's non positive so it's non uh, sorry. It's going to be, yeah, never strictly positive, okay? So what that means is that the epsilon is actually can be said to be zero. That can happen, and we are very lucky when, uh, when this happens. And so now really, um, what we need to compute is the delta, and the delta is the probability that in the ideal world, g hat, we generate such a bad transcript, where there is an overlap between the direct queries to the permutation and the encryption encryption queries via the key. So here, that's exactly where, again, the fact that the problem is asymmetric plays to our advantage. In fact, if you switch to f and g, you will have a very hard time finishing the proof. So this is the right way of doing it. So now here, the beautiful thing about this is that in the ideal world, this key k was chosen at the end, independent of everything else. And now what we need to do is we need to look at all of the input-output pairs in this like pi of tau that are defined by encryption-decryption queries, all of the pi of tau that are defined by direct permutation uh, uh, queries. And, and you want to show what's the probability that you have some x, y here and some u, v here such that, you know, x, x or k is equal u or y, x or k is equal v. But it's actually easy to compute because the k is chosen at the end. So basically you run the execution until the end then you look at that point, uh, the two sets are defined and now you just compute this probability. Right, and what is that? Well, it's simply, you look at all possible pairs that you can have, so it's QP times QPi, uh, pi. these are the queries to either of the oracles. <laughs> and then you have probability one over N that this happens for the inputs or the outputs, so that's why you have a two. And then you maximize overall choices of QP and QPi, and you get that this is the most Q square over two N, and you're done. So the reason I, I wanted to show you such proofs is that if you are familiar with, say, Bellarian Rogaway's game playing method, try to go back and prove the same theorem with that, with that method, and you'll see that you're going to struggle a lot. In fact, one of the reasons that you're going to struggle a lot is because many frameworks that are used to, to do such proofs, they typically do something like introduce a bad event, which is clear what it is, and now show that as long as that bad event doesn't happen, the real world and the ideal world are identical. If not, upper bound with the probability that the upper, you know, and not then the advantage will become the probability that the bad event happens. So the edge coefficient method doesn't require you, the, the, the words to be identical when you are in the good set. You just have this ratio condition, and here they are indeed different, but because this thing is more or equal than zero, you don't even care how different they are. It just all like goes away. And, uh, and then you just care about these probabilities and it's super easy. So you don't have to do a bunch of hybrids and stuff like that. Okay, so that's, that's the one big example. Um, which actually I want to talk only for 10 more minutes. Uh, if there are no questions, or I like, scare you all off, I wanted to point out, again, if you are familiar with game playing and other such framework, I, I just want to point out a little bit more what I just said and just go into the relationship. But there's a question there at the back. So. Uh, so coming back to the definition of uh, the lemma of Hitch coefficient method, so you yep. said that they're very asymmetrical, like F and G right. they have different rules. Uh, so I guess here it helped us because of the fact that we only have to take care of uh, the probability that the bad transcript when you're interacting with the ideal world where we're choosing key in the end, right. which is easier to analyze. So I guess if we switch the rules of F and G, then I think it will make our life difficult in some sense. Yeah, it will make uh, it much harder. Yeah. So, uh, can you give some intuition why? So, for example, the hedge coefficient method. So, on the when you're bounding the advantage when distinguishing f and g, it's a very symmetrical quantity. But 
on the right hand side the upper bound is a very asymmetrical quantity so uh why is that the case um can you give some intuition or uh yeah so it, it's it's hard to to really i mean at least i don't have a good intuition, depending which kind of answer you want. Maybe let me answer first when it's easier, so how you pick the order. Um, so, so usually uh, it, it is easier in this type of problems to, to always pick, uh, so G, so the one where you compute the bad probability to be the ideal world. And the reason for that is that in many analysis, uh, the bad event is always some internal collision happening or some sorts. And that's something that it's defined in the real world, whereas in the ideal world doesn't even make sense. So you kind of have to enhance the ideal world to make sense, to even define it. And then you typically will be in such situations where like the probability doesn't even depend on something execution dependent and things are easy. Now, uh, whether this asymmetry is inherent, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure how to even like exactly answer that. Not, not, it's, a, it's a great question, but I don't know what's a good answer in a sense that it's more like the method is inherently asymmetric and you have to make a choice, although the, the quantity itself is very symmetric, right? So um, I don't know if it's, uh, there's a good answer. Like, is there a method which is more symmetric and will allow you to do things? Uh, I, I don't think so, but uh, yeah. Good, thanks. Yeah. Can I also ask something? Yeah. Um, so while it's clear to me that the H coefficient method at least philosophically maps to Bellari Rogerie game ops upwards, I was wondering if it also mathematically maps to it. So like if I were if I were to collide all the abort events in a single in, in a single event, would that be exactly that the delta that I'm removing from the advantage? Yeah, so uh, that's actually what I, it's a great question. That's what I want to go into now uh, to see how they map. Um, so I, I'll show you that, and it's also kind of the interesting question. So I show you that in the way we think about it, the, the, the framework is more limited, but it doesn't need to be. It's oftentimes it's more a matter of usability of this framework more than the fact that they cannot express what we want. And, I, and I'll make this precise in the next five slides. It's sort of a subtle point. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, Thank good. You. So that, that's that. Thing. Then, then tell me at the end if this answers your question. Yeah. So, so right. So, so the first thing I want to show is that. Sorry, can I ask you? Oh, yeah. Sorry, question? sorry, sorry. I missed it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know what is the uh, the game for pi. So, what? How is it a PRP? Because when you defined it, there was a key involved. Yes. Yeah. So uh, let's see. So actually, maybe let me go back so that I can. So let me just one, one second. So actually. So the, the, the formal definition is exactly what we have here. So I mean formal in quotes, right? But it's, we are showing indistinguishability of these two worlds, right? So in the real world, there is a key and a random permutation. And then uh, you can query the permutation forward and backwards. And you can query the construction forwards and backwards. And you see when you evaluate the construction, this depends on the key. So you are evaluating take the input, XOR the key, apply the permutation, and XOR the key again, and the other query is just the inverse of that. And then, in the ideal world, we are just replacing these lower two oracles to be answered with an independent random permutation. Does that answer the question? Or? Um, I, I think I'll ask you afterwards. Uh, up to you, we can, you know. Uh, yeah. Okay, sure, thank you. Yeah, okay. Good, so, the final thing was exactly this connection with, um, that you were asking about, Bellari Rogaway, and in fact, Maurer's random system framework and many others do similar things. Uh, so there, the, the, the nice thing about these frameworks is there, there's a different, there's kind of like the opposite philosophical of what I'm doing. Rather than capturing the input-output behavior of the systems and making statements that depend on probabilities, you really leverage syntactical representations of the systems a lot to make reasoning in a different way easy. So you will have statements where, you, in fact, the representation, so here they're called games, but really you can think of them as description of systems uh, just with pseudocode. And, and then you will highlight the fact that, say, they, they are identical up to a particular point where they diverge uh, in the sense that one instruction is executed only in one and not in the other, and then that will trigger a bad condition, and then you, that immediately allows you to say that the two systems behave identically up to this bad condition, and then you upper bound the advantage with the probability that you trigger that bad condition. And in fact, so Maurer had a formalization of this, which was more in the language of random systems, 
and basically already hints at what's going on in the language we developed so far. So, so, so what he suggested, and this is not the language of the first paper, this iterated a lot. Basically every paper kind of changed the language a little bit. This is the one I like the most. And so one way to think about it is that you say, well, let's imagine that I just enhance my systems to have at every query, there's an additional auxiliary bit that is given out, which will tell me whether uh, the, a particular bad condition has happened or not. And it's monotone in a set that if the bad condition happens, it has happened, you can't go back. So once this thing turns to one, then it stays one, right? So it's just like I'm surfacing to the outside the fact that this bad condition inside has happened. And so it's really the dual way of this bellari roga review. Instead of pseudocode, I describe it at the level of input output behavior, but it's capturing the same idea. And so we have a, um, for, for such a system in particular, the one system the adversary really interacts is this sort of cap system that doesn't actually tell me whether the condition has happened. And I write it with this F bottom, right? But then I can enhance it with this additional output, right? And then the condition of being equivalent until bad, what it basically tells you is that these two systems, F and G, the, the system with the monotone output that tells me whether the condition happens or not, are the same in terms of, let's say, interpolation probabilities for trans, so now the transcript will really include also the conditions, whether the condition happened or not, the binary output. And as long as these outputs are all zeros, uh, I think I even wrote it in a slightly more complicated way than necessary here. As long as the outputs are all zero, then the two systems behave identically in terms of interpolation probabilities. That's what equivalent until bad means in the language we have done. And then you can really derive their theorem uh, uh, just as a special case of H coefficient. So you just say that I have uh, two systems F and G uh, that have such a monotone binary output. And then I just look at the probability so what is this probability is, is if I let a distinguisher interact with either F and G, what is the probability that the interaction will produ produce a one uh, in the, uh, as, the, as the binary output? And what turns out that you can show is that the, the advantage is upper bounded by the probability of making this condition go bad as the output, um, the, the, the output becomes one. And actually in this particular case, it's one of those cases where you can do things symmetrically. It doesn't matter because the equivalence that you're given is symmetric then you can actually also uh, choose the order you want and you will get the same proof. And basically what you do is you define transcript where the condition becomes one as bad. As long as you have a zero, the ratio is going to be exactly one. So everything is fine. The probability is identical. And the probability that you provoke a bad transcript is exactly the probability that you set the condition to one. So to answer the part of your question, so yes, you can see this as a, absolutely as a special case of H coefficient. And I don't think this was clear for many years, although it's pretty straightforward that H coefficient is actually more general than that. At least it looks like it. Except, and that's the final thing I want to say before we go for an early lunch so that we are on schedule. Uh, it turns out that, however, in terms of actual expressiveness, this equivalent until bad uh, is actually has expressive in a very weird way. And this is actually, uh, there's a series of theorems like that, some of which involve Chishto, who's sitting at the back. There's a very cool theorem that basically says that, in fact, if I give you any two systems, F and G, that you want to prove indistinguishable, there is actually always a way to define such a bad condition on them uh, that will basically make the probability of creating this bad condition. So you yeah, change the notation here. So this is the the best probability of creating the bad condition true to making it true for a Q query distinguisher. Uh, but so what you can show is that you can always give such an optimal monotone binary output, such an optimal bad condition that will make the system equivalent until bad and the probability of provoking it is exactly the distinguishing advantage. So it's kind of confusing because it kind of contradicts everything I've done before because it's telling you, well, actually you didn't have to bother. You could have used these type of frameworks as well and proved the optimal bound. Now, the caveat in all of this is that this is really an existential result. So it's telling you that in a probabilistic sense, you can always define such a condition, but it will be some statement of the type, well, given this particular interaction so far, there is a probability you can define that the condition will become true and blah, 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 but you don't necessarily want to give it uh, explicitly. So although the, 
the approaches are all equivalent in terms of expressiveness. They're not necessarily equivalent in the sense of which one gives you an easy proof and which one doesn't. So I, and, and that's the bottom line here. So H coefficient really allows you more easily to tackle analysis of certain systems which are not, where you cannot easily give a condition that makes them equivalent, although in principle you could, but it's just hard to do that. All right, so that's everything I wanted to say, actually. So I'll thank you here. But uh, I'm happy to answer more questions. So tomorrow, we are going to see a few interesting examples where H coefficient is really not enough. And this idea of good and bad really will take us to either too complicated proofs or will not even give us tight analysis. All right, thank you.